Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Jump On Air. We're so happy you've chosen to spend a little of your Monday with us as we explore statistics, science, data, and of course, jump. My name is Julian Paris. I am the Learning Strategy Manager here at Jump Software. And as always, I get the privilege to be your host for Jump On Air. We have a great schedule for you today, full of interesting speakers sharing their thoughts, sharing their wisdom, and their knowledge with us. I'm going to show this schedule throughout the day so we can keep ourselves on track. And this is also so if you need to disconnect and you want to come back, you know where we'll be at the schedule. So you can always reconnect using that one link, jump.com slash jump on air, and that'll take you right back to the live stream no matter which device you're on. And if you need to check the schedule, remember you can always go to jump.com slash JOA, the link you can share with others, but that also will show that same schedule to you throughout the day. After the show, we really hope you'll interact with us on our community page, community.jump.com slash jump on air. That's where you can interact with us on the individual segment pages. You can ask questions of our famous, fabulous presenters, uh, and you can also make show suggestions. So if there are things you want to see on Jump on Air, make sure to let us know, and so we can produce them for a later episode. Now, I always like to start, start the show with a little something, and I'm going to do another segment of I bought this and I'm going to tell you about it. Now, as always, these opinions are simply my own and I have no financial interest in any of these items. I just like to tell people about things I love. And so that's what I want to do in this segment. Now, today I'm going to talk about optimizing. And I want to actually talk about something I mentioned on Friday uh, first before I get into the main part of this segment. And on Friday, I mentioned something that was annoying to me, which is that I pay for gigabit internet. And in my office down here, I can only get about half a gigabit of speed. And so on Friday, we talked about the measurement of that speed and some of the, the things that go into that and the weak law of large numbers. But I want to talk about fixing this because over the weekend, I had a couple things delivered that I bought. And the first was this flexible Ethernet cable. So it's this flat Ethernet jumper cable that you can shove into a window and the window can still close over it. So this allowed me to run 100 feet of Cat6 cable that I buried around my house and that returned a happy Julian who now gets gigabit into his house. Now, the reason I brought this up is because uh, the reason I spend my time doing these things is because I like things to work the way they should, but I like things to be optimal. And so today I want to talk about some things I have for optimizing workflow. Now, some of these may apply to you and some won't, but I hope you'll see that there's value into optimizing your workflow. The first one I want to talk about is something that if you're a photographer like I am or videographer or anyone who uses any Adobe product is the loop deck, which is a really cool control surface I own, which allows you to have physical keys or physical uh, pieces or physical switches, I should say, uh, to common actions that you use in software. And so the loop deck is pretty cool and it's configurable. This is a, what a loop deck template looks like for Lightroom where you can control things like clarity, contrast. There's even a set of controls when you want to uh, change the saturation of the different hues and channels. And so the, the loop deck allows you to, with a control surface, modify the things that you would normally have to do through menus or normally do with your mouse. And so it makes your workflow faster, but also takes you less out of the experience of the editing of your photo. And so I really like that. Now, Another thing I use, another control surface that's actually really relevant to the show is something called a Stream Deck. And this is something that my colleague Ryan turned me on to. And I simply love the Stream Deck. It's a little control surface that has a bunch of OLED screens that can be configured to do really whatever you want. And so the setup that I have, this is what sits on my desk and you'll see me poking it every once in a while. And this is what I actually use to switch between the scenes of Jump On Air. That is, I have it configured in the software to have little actions that occur when I press each button. And this actually interacts with another piece of software called Wirecast, which is what serves up those little video stinger videos. And so this is what allows me to do this without fumbling through software looking for the next scene. I can simply have it preset and click to the next scene. Now, what's pretty cool about the Stream Deck is you can configure separate profiles. And so I have it set up like this during the show, but actually I change the profile to a general set of buttons when I'm just using it in my day-to-day -day work. And so if we look at this close up, I have buttons for common applications I use. I have Jump at the top right, so I can instantly bring Jump up. I can go to certain folders on my computer, go to certain websites I commonly use. I even have a profile set up just for Jump, where I have JSL snippets that I commonly use when scripting. So I can just press a button to put names default to here, or press a button to put a for loop in my code. And so you can configure this to do really anything you want, 
And there's multiple sizes that you can buy. So I have the big one, but you can try it out with a very small one or even try the mobile. So it's worth looking into. Now, the Keen Observer may have noticed that on their desk is a pretty elaborate control surface already, which is your keyboard. And so if you want to take advantage of specifying very specific keyboard shortcuts or making special shortcuts, I have two pieces of software to recommend to you. The one that I use on my Mac is called Better Touch Tool, which lets you configure all sorts of things, not just for your keyboard, but also your touch bar, if you have a Mac with a new touch bar. But I have certain keyboard setups for uh, particular applications. Again, for Jump, I have certain keys mapped to common actions. So I can launch into distribution, bit Y by X, Recode, even Graph Builder with just a quick keyboard shortcut. And so for things you do often, you can really optimize that workflow to hop right into things. And once you've memorized these, then it really becomes second nature. Now, if you're on a Windows machine, I've heard auto hotkey is pretty good. I can't tell you uh, anything personal about that, but it is one that I have some colleagues who use. All right, so if you are using a keyboard, and you are, and using common applications, I invite you to look at the keyboard shortcuts that are already there. So you don't have to buy anything. Chrome has pages of shortcuts, and these also work in Safari, in Edge, and all your other browsers. So it's worth looking into these. And an application we all use, Jump, if you go to the Help menu and go to the Quick Reference card, there's a bunch of keyboard shortcuts in there. So without buying anything, you can actually start to optimize your workflow by finding the things you do often and then learning a keyboard shortcut or two every week. That's really the best way to do it. Obviously not memorizing all of these at once because it simply won't stick. So in that spirit, I wanna show you a couple of keyboard shortcuts that I could not live without that I suggest you learn. So one, for any web browser, I just have Chrome there, jumping to the location bar. So you know when you want to type in a URL and you have Chrome or any other browser open, press Control L on a Windows machine or Command L for location, and you'll hop right up to the URL bar. You don't have to go hunting for it with your mouse, you can go right there. Now, for jump users, which almost all of us are, there's some that you should really know, like previously selected row and next selected row. So let's say you click on a row in a graph, click on a bar, let's say, or something in a graph, and you want to find it in the table, don't go scrolling in the table. Press F6 to go to the previous row, or F7 for the next row, if you're on a Windows machine. Or use the Command key and the brace, left or right, to go to it on a uh, Mac. So those are absolutely worth remembering because you'll find that row in record time. And now one final one, no matter what computer you're on or what application you're in, this is one that I use a lot because I have to say I'm not the best typist. So I get halfway through a word and I realized I've typed garbage. So if you want to delete that whole word, don't hit the delete key a bunch of times. That is slow. Control backspace or option backspace on your keyboard will just delete that whole word so you can try it again. I use this a lot because being a terrible typer, I need to save time when I can. And so being able to trash that last word is really quite useful. All right, so this is another edition of I Bought This and now I've told you about it. But I hope even if you don't buy any of the things I mentioned, you take a minute to learn a few of those keyboard shortcuts because you can really start to use your computer a little more fast and a little more effectively. And if you can optimize anything, something you do all the time is a good place to start. All right. So we have a great show for you today. I want to turn it over to our first featured program, our first speaker, Mike Anderson, who's taking us through another edition of things he wishes he knew when he first started using Jump. And this time, he's going to tell us about the distribution platform. Morning, everyone. And today we're going to start, we're going to go into a platform you may know about already. You probably have seen it. You've probably played with it. But the thing I want to bring home about this, particularly for people that are just getting started in Jump, is how powerful the distribution platform actually is and how much ground you can cover with just using the distrib distribution platform. And so for the next little bit, we're going to go through some of, the, some of the things that I love about the distribution platform. And uh, at the end, we'll take a few minutes and we'll ask everybody's questions. We'll let, give a, people a chance to ask questions as well. So uh, start thinking about your questions. Locate the, the question and answer window in the Zoom interface and uh, we'll take it from there. Okay, so the distribution platform is an incredibly powerful tool. 
Let's go ahead and let's go into jump here and I'll show you what I'm talking about. Just to start off with, it's usually the place I like to start people off when they're learning jump. We go to distri jump distribution and we can add multiple variables into the distribution platform at once. I can grab a bunch of variables in this data set and just drag them over and bring all my process variables in as well. And they're down here at the bottom. And I click OK. And I have all of these variables built in, or I have, I have distributions for all of these variables. And that's awesome by itself. But combining, and I've already got this set up, it's a little easier to see here. Combining just the histogram, just the visual uh, visualization that comes with distribution, you can cover an incredible amount of ground when you're learning about a new data set. For instance, I can select my low yielding material in this data set and I can see that low yield also tends to correlate with low methanol concentrations. I don't, I don't see anything special in ethanol. I can look down here and I can quickly see that pH might actually have an effect low yield, high pH. So I can get some visual understanding about my data really quickly just by marrying or taking advantage of the histogram in the distribution and the interactivity of that distribution. The other thing you may have noticed is that when in this particular data set, I've got a target here. And I didn't have to do anything to get those lines. Those lines came about because I told Jump in the data table what my spec limit and what my target were for this. The distribution platform is one of the platforms that relies heavily on column properties. And so the more you tell Jump about your data table in the column properties, the less work you have to do in distribution. You can get, when you give it the spec limits, you can get capability analysis. You can get, as you see here, those targets automatically graphed. There's lots of things you can do from within here. Let's look at some others. Now, if you were to follow the jump workflow, and in this case, I've got just one of those variables right here shown. If you were to follow the jump workflow that we covered in the first episode, or then the second episode, excuse me, we would make a graph or we would create a platform that has a graph. We would look at the graph, We'd then ask questions about what we see, and then we'd push the answer button to get answers to those questions. In this case, there's lots of red triangles in the, in the, in the, the distribution platform. We have lots of questions that we can get answers to, is another way of thinking about it. The one that people generally focus on is the, the red triangle, is this red triangle here at the top, where right next to the variable. I'm going to skip that one for just a minute and bring, come bring you down to this little red triangle, this answer button that people commonly will forget. And the entry in here that I like to look at is the customize summary statistics. There's a reason for that. Look at all of these different summary statistics we can get that we don't have to calculate any other way. We can just get them as we want. We can come along with the walls. We can get a number of different means. We can get the min, max, the median, the mode, the robust variables where we look at, where we make our mean and standard deviations uh, robust to outliers. Lots of things that we can work with in here. And all you have to do to get those is select one. I'm gonna put the median and the mode on this data set. And automatically it's added to the list. So if you wanna know about the skew of your data set, you can get it from here. The next thing I wanna talk about are some of the visualizations. And this is, when I was first teaching statistics, this was my favorite visualization to bring to people. Because a lot of the things that we, that we teach in, in introductory statistics classes assume, rely on this assumption of normality. And, uh, this is probably one of my favorite ways to check it really quickly. So if we come under the red triangle, this is called the normal quantile plot. And we can just turn it right on from here. And we can see a little red line 
that shows us our line of normality. The closer the data sits to that line, the more likely it is, is to be a normal from a normal distribution. We can see we might have an outlier out here, possibly, I don't know. We'd have to go look at that in a little more detail. Blue line here, or green line here, that's the median. Lots of information just from that one plot, and you can turn it on really easily. Also, you can turn on a lot of these features that I'm showing you in the preferences. So if you come, come under File, oh, excuse me, on Mac, it's File, it's under Jump Preferences. On Windows, it's under File Preferences. But if you come under the Preferences, into the Platforms, and come down here to Distribution, you can turn on a lot of these capabilities that I'm showing you. And you even have one for a distribution summary of fit where you, or summary statistics that you can turn on your desired statistics, the ones that you wanna see all the time. I'm gonna leave it uh, at default for the moment for the rest of this. The next thing that we can do is we can start doing hypothesis testing. We can do some parametric, uh, tests with this. And this is where, this is some of the things that people generally either forget that they're there or they just kind of gloss, gloss over. So people will commonly, they'll, they'll use the display options, they'll use the histogram options, they'll use the, norm, the, the plots here. And then right about here at the CDF plot, the, their eyes will glaze over and they'll skip down to here to the, maybe to the confidence interval, but usually they're coming down to the process capability and the continuous fit. Uh, options. So the things I want to draw your attention to are, at the moment are some options in the middle here. Now, the first one of those is the mean. In this case, I'm just going to eyeball it. Looks normal-ish. Of course, using hand grenades again. For the sake of argument, we'll run it. But I can say, okay, given that this is a, a reasonably normal distribution, what is my how likely is this distribution around a particular target? Well, I can give it a target. I can say, in this case, in the, in the example that's already up there, I did 30, let's do 28. If I know the standard deviation, I can put that in as well. If I want to do a non-parametric, I just turn on that box. But if I just click OK, it gives me a t-test right here. Quick and easy. Likewise, if I want to do a standard deviation, a test on the standard deviation, a one sample standard deviation test, we can come into the test standard deviation. That in and of itself is candy. My favorite thing in here that people generally don't use is the, well, at least that I haven't run into that use a lot, is the equivalence testing. Now, when we talk about hypothesis testing, we're generally trying to determine if something is different or the same. What about the gray area when your statistical ses test says it's different, but your practical knowledge says, yeah, it's different, but it's not different enough for me to, for it to matter. That gray area is where this other idea of equivalence testing lives and it's incredibly powerful. So generally what you do for this workflow is you run a mean test first to see, to establish difference. In this case, I did it. And then you come under the red triangle and you can do test equivalence. And you can say, my hypothesized mean, I'm gonna do the same thing I did before is 30. And I'm gonna say, what is the difference? How different does it have to be before I consider it practically different? Or in this, the way they say it here is, what difference do we not care about? And uh, I think in the other, in the example I have here, I said five, so we'll just run that. And then I need to set my confidence level as well. And it runs a t-test, and then it runs a what's called a two-sided, a two one-sided uh, tests is what it's called, and it gives you a report down here. And more importantly, it gives you this nice little graph that makes it easier to understand. And then it gives you a little help down here at the very bottom to interpret what that means. So basically, based on all this information, we can't conclude that the mean is equivalent to 30. So they're practically different, as well as being statistically different. And again, there's lots of options in here. The big thing is, though, the power with the, with the distribution is that it, it, is, it has a lot of capabilities that most people kind of gloss over. But 
you can get a lot of ground with this. You can cover a lot of ground with this. You can get into a lot of interesting questions just with that first entry in the, uh, in the analyze menu. And that's what I wanted to cover for today. So we'll take a moment. Uh, we'll, Julian, why don't we give it a two minute counter and uh, give everybody a chance to find the question and answer window. I'll be keeping an eye on it. If you've got any questions about what we covered today or if you just wanna try and stump me, you're more than welcome to. I, I, I'm happy to say I don't know. Um, and uh, we'll take it from there. Julian, let's give it a, a two minute counter, please. Right. Well, we're back. Uh, we've got, oh, we've got three questions. One just came, came in right at the wire. All right. So uh, let's go ahead and let's uh, answer, start working with these questions. The first one came in is, instead of equivalence, can we test for non-inferiority? Now, I'm, I haven't run into that term before, so I tend to sit on the, on the manufacturing side of things, so the, the, the clinical question. But I did a quick lookup of what the definition of that is, and it's, as I understand it, it means it's uh, no worse than a competitor's product. And um, I believe the equivalence test would work for that. But instead of saying that definitively, what I'm going to do is go do some research. I've got a couple of colleagues that spend a lot of time in clinical trials work, and I'm going to ask them that question. And I'll post the answer with the, with this video in the, um, with this video in the, uh, in the community. So keep an eye on that question. Uh, and uh, I'll uh, or keep an eye out for this video recording and I'll put the answer there as soon as I get it. Uh, another question, what type of test is possible in, on the analyze menu and not in graph builder? Well, that's a great question. So graph builder, let's look at graph builder really quick. And this is, this is kind of an interesting idea because there are, there are places in graph builder that blur the lines between what, what, I, what I would categorize as an analytical tool and what I would categorize as a visualization tool. That's a great question. So, and let's, let's look at this. So for graph builder, and I'm just gonna use this as an example, I've got this variable and I happen to know that this variable plays with this variable. And if I put a line of fit on this, if I look over in the lower left corner, and this is the, the true, if you, if you wanna talk about a secret to learning, learning graph builder, it's to pay attention to this stuff underneath the columns list. Uh, you can really get into some interesting visualizations with this stuff. But let's look at this really quickly. So what statistics can we get? We can get the root mean squared error, R squared equation of fit, and the F test. So that's an ANOVA. That's what you can get from there. Now, that's it. Now, and in fact, if we switch to a categorical variable, 
let's just do, oh, let's not do solvent supplier. I haven't cleaned up the data yet. Let's just do this. It'll switch over from, you notice we lose the line of fit and we can, but we can get back the means and standard deviations displayed as well. So we can get some, I wouldn't call it rudimentary, but we can get some, some high level understanding of what's going on from a fit standpoint in Graph Builder. Now, there's a neat trick that you may not know about in Graph Builder that you can use to take it even deeper. If you come under the red triangle and think about the workflow, right? We've made a graph, we've looked at it, we, we, we've done some analysis and now we're asking some questions. You know, what other statistics, you know, I'm not seeing the statistic I want, but it's over in fit model. Well, if we come under red tri the red triangle and come down, it's way down here at the bottom. This thing says launch analysis. This takes all the variables that you've given Graph Builder and dumps them into fit model and you can just click run. And now you can get your analysis of variance. You can get all of your, your, your get a much more, a much richer suite of statistical understanding just by following that same workflow. So the short list is, uh, is uh, Graph Builder I tend to describe as primarily a visualization tool, but incredibly powerful in that regard. And along with that, you get some statistics, but you also get a path to deeper uh, modeling capabilities within the software by going through Graph Builder. Now, the third question, is it possible to transform a variable on the fly in the distribution menu? To, so for instance, to see if the transformation improved the symmetry of the data around the center value. That is a great question. Now, there's a couple of ways you can do this. And I'm going to set this up really quick. I'm gonna move this into a split table here so I can see this. And by the way, I'm doing this in a jump project. This is one of the advantages of, having a, of working in a jump project. So if you're not doing it, uh, give it a shot. I can come in and I can grab a variable and I can drag it in and, attack and add it into distribution. Couple that, couple that with the ability to come into Graph Builder or into, into the data table and right click and do a new column transformation. So this is percent yield. It makes no sense to do this, but I'm just gonna do a log just for the, the sake of argument here. And I can then grab my log transform and bring it in and see if it does a better job than the other. That's one way of doing it. The other way of doing it is if you're, if you're not sure that your data is actually normal, a good thing to do is to come in and do a continuous fit and kind of, you know, this is a bit of a fishing expedition. I like doing the fit all, but if you've got an idea about what the transform is, like a log normal, that's doing the log uh, of, a, of a column of data more or less, you can run that log normal and then you can come down to the red triangle for there and turn on a diagnostic plot to see how the fit is, to see how it behaves. So there's a couple of different ways of approaching that problem. That was a great question, by the way. Um, I'll give everybody a, a chance to ask any more questions really quick. Last call. Mike, I have one or just something yeah, Julian. I would like you to show. Yeah. Uh, I love the data table transform and dragging it into distribution. Maybe you can show that also in Graph Builder using the transforms oh. within the columns list. Oh yes, that's a great way. Thank you for bringing that up. I forgot about that entirely. All right, so let's do this. There's another way you can do this. And Julian brought it up. So if we've got a columns list over here, if we've got an active columns list, we don't even need to create it in the data table. We can create a transform column inside of the columns list here. So let's do it again. I'm gonna take my methanol, I'm gonna right click, and there's my transforms list. And in this case, I'll do, oh, I don't know why not, let's just square it. And I can bring that in and I can bring in my log of that. And let's bring in my methanol in here as well. And then I can do all of those against the same variable, I'm doing this backwards, but yeah, you can still get the point. Or even let's just do a histogram of those and get rid of that. 
there. And we can get a feel for how those different variables behave in Graph Builder as well. That doesn't, that works not just in, not just in Graph Builder. That column transform works everywhere that you have a column list. So give that a little bit of a thought about the kind of games you can play with your column list. Thank you, Julian. That was a great, great question. Um, and I guess we're right at, right at the end. Um, oh, I got one. Do I have one more? I have one more. One more question. Uh, P-value animation and power animation. Hmm. I haven't seen those actually. Let's go look and see if we can find those. Yeah, do a uh, one sample hypothesis test in distribution yeah, then and then see. check out the red triangle next to your uh, report table. Oh, look at that. I learned something today. Okay, that's kind of cool as well. And that brings up another great point. Everybody around here, there's probably maybe five people on the planet that know everything about jump. And I am not one of them. So there, you can look at, you can look at how the mean changes your two-sided, your one-sided, your high side, your low side hypothesis test. It's a great way for inspecting how your mean is going to behave against your hypothesized test as well. It's and Mike, try tracking your uh, left axis out a little bit there so you can find the distribution under the null. Oh, other way, sorry. Other way? Yeah. Oh, there it is. Look at that. Yeah. Right and then if you drag that against your, it does the shading for you. Oh, that's, that's clever. And then you can control the estimated mean as well. That's fun. There we go. Uh, question, what version of jump am I, am I running? I'm running jump 15, 15.1 specifically. Uh, a lot of the things I've shown are, have been in jump, uh, well, the transform columns, I think was jump 13 at least. I know it's been in there since there at least. Um, and then everything else has pretty much been in there since. In, I mean, distribution platform is one of the oldest platforms in the software and a lot of this stuff has been in there since time out of mind, so. It's been in there a while. Um, so great learning session on, on everybody. I learned something new. That's cool. Um, and let's go ahead and let's wrap this up for today to give uh, us enough time to transition. Um, join me next week. We're going to talk about the secret of the Jump Masters. Uh, officially, this is the last thing in the five things series, but uh, there are two more after that, I think. Uh, so. Join me next week and we'll talk about what the true jump masters all, all, all have in common and all do. Julian, back to you. Outstanding. Thanks so much, Mike. I always love seeing the things you have to show. Uh, dude, make sure to check out Mike's segment page because he is going to answer some additional questions and the non-inferiority question will be up there. So make sure to check that out. Community.jump.com slash jump on air. In our next segment, we have Pete and Mary back to act out real-life scenarios where a jump tip is actually the solution to a problem. Welcome to Jump On Air's Tip of the Day. And Mary, I, I need some help from you today. I'm, I got some bad news. My um, home school had to close down. Uh, we, we had some, some very bad results our, our both our students got expelled for fighting and um, the teacher got uh, fired for drinking on the job so I, I, I need some good news from you and I heard you got something cool to show me so so what's up oh you're right well I feel bad for that yeah, yeah. the worst thing that's happening to me is that um, my um, my dog is hiding in the closet because it's too many walks so <laughs> Get, anyhow, get away from me. <laughs> yeah. Anyhow, I do have something exciting. So you know how I like to go off to the web a lot and explore data and try and find data, and especially mm -hmm. on the CDC website and all this. Yeah, well, I, for brand and recipes. Normally, yeah. I download it, and then I have to go through all this gyration to get it into jump. Well, what I discovered was I can go and use this internet open, and I have the choice of a web page or Google Sheets. So I'm going to use a web page, and if I copied and pasted the uh, URL, and 
since it's spring and there's birds all over the place and I just went and bought some bird food, I was interested in the birds that were around. And so anyhow, we're gonna look at bird data. Sounds good. So under the open as, you can see I have data, text, or a web page. I'm just gonna select data. Nice. And I just want the, um, let me get a little wider so that everybody can see, um, just the photographs of the birds. Okay. Now I, you have the option, once I jump identifies data, it will prompt you and say, do you want all this data or just this one? What do you want? You say, yeah. okay. And it automatically brings this data into jump. Now uh -huh. what, what's nice is it's already in the form that I need that jump likes. Now you notice that there's load pictures and there were some bird pictures. So jump recognized that there were pictures and it provides this script. And if I run it and you notice on the bottom here, I got photography picture. Uh -huh. I go all the way over, I get the pictures of the birds. Whoa, what, so that's awesome. There, isn't that neat? And look at, yeah. that, look at that big turkey. What, what state is that? I don't know. Oh, it's Alabama, Alabama. Yeah, figures. Turkey. Well, you know, I don't care for their football team so much. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry if I offended anybody that roots for Alabama. But, um, and you notice it has a different icon here. So if I select this and of course right mouse click and go into column info, you notice the data type is considered an expression. Oh, cool. So it's, so it's it jump knows that this is not, you know, a row state or categorical or continuous. So anyhow, that was pretty neat. Um, I'm also going to right mouse click here and you notice besides column info, I can label. Now this labels, um, every those pictures so when i go and create my graph these will actually come up as i hover over the data the data point that i have the actual picture but this other thing that i wanted to share with you if we we look at year here right you notice uh -huh. we got these brackets and stuff and that's just you know i hate cluttered axes yeah if i go to columns utilities you ready for this, Pete? Uh, yeah, show me. Next to column, and I just put that square bracket. Say okay. It creates a new column for me. Oh, handy. Here, so you know it's just a shortcut to recode. It was a quick one, and so okay. now I have year. So I'm gonna go up to Graph Builder. I'm gonna say year one. Just stick it there, nice and clean. Um, and I'm going to put my states along the bottom and so done. Nice and big because I know you have a hard time seeing things. I do, I do. So if we look at um, Colorado here, we hover over it, we actually see the bird. And what's another interesting thing, I don't know if you knew this, but you can tell I'm so excited about what I discovered <laughs> today. Yeah. It must be all the coffee I drank. And you have <laughs> this little pin. Uh -huh. I actually pin it and it just stays up. Oh, that's a, that's uh -huh. super handy. And I, I, I love that Colorado has a very gray looking bird as our state bird. That's that's wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> yep. So you can put the picture in if I don't want that one pinned. But I like the fact that I can put a label on a column and actually hover on a point and get a picture. Now just for sort of think about if you had other information that you wanted to display when you hovered on things. So all you would have to do is label a column. That's awesome. And, and thank you, Mary. I think uh, that's a very useful tip of the day. And uh, join in I next time. <laughs> yeah, you got an extra tip there. So thank yeah. you. And, and until next time. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Pete and Mary. Uh, fun fact, there are actually three states that have turkeys as their state bird. So not just Alabama chose a really poor state bird. Uh, I'm excited about our next segment. We have another edition of Meet a Jump Developer. And this time we have Manny Chambers here to talk about cleaning up in Jump. We're very excited to have you, Mandy, to join us today. Um, one of our amazing testing team members in the Jump Development Group. So thank hey, you I'm for taking happy to time. be here. Good, good. So let's start by telling us where did you grow up? 
Um, I grew up right here in North Carolina. Um, I grew up in Greensboro, which is about an hour away. And um, both my parents still live there. So it's nice because they're not very far away. Um, so not too far. I grew up right here. <laughs> good, good. Okay. Well, then where did you go to school and what did you study? Well, I went to Carolina, UNC, and yes, I'm a Tar Heel. Um, so it makes for quite a bit of um, fun. It works sometimes with uh, NC State grads that they're, um, you know, plentiful. Um, as JUMP is growing and SAS is growing, we have a lot more graduates from kind of all over, not just the ACC, but everywhere. And so it makes things a lot of fun with um, sports and, and all of that. So um, I actually majored in math and I taught school for um, a short time. Oh, wow, okay. And so you taught, but what else did you do before you joined JUMP? Before I joined JUMP, um, after the teaching, I actually got a job um, in Greensboro working at a hospital. And I was doing some kind of ad hoc reporting for doctors um, using a very um, archaic kind of system back then. And I went from there to UNC Chapel Hill and worked at that hospital working in uh, financial kind of accounts receivable for a short time before I, I landed at, at SAS and in um, technical support. And then I went to core testing and worked in the R&D side of testing on SAS side. Okay, well then how long have you been at JUMP and how did you find your way to our division? Um, I've been in JUMP now about five years ago, a little bit over five years. And this is kind of a, a cool story. Um, so I'm part of a women's group at SAS called WIN. And um, back at the time that um, this, the a jump job came up, um, the group is really cool. It does, they do a lot with career development and we, we do a lot with STEM. We go out to the middle schools and we teach um, students about um, trying to get them motivated to stay in uh, um, science, technology, engineering, and math, you know, mm -hmm. academia, and we teach them these classes, one of which is wild track. So I've had the opportunity to, to teach that um, several times. I find it very, very, very interesting. Um, but they encouraged me, these women, um, to apply for this job. I think I kept thinking, well, I'm just kind of doing the same thing. I'm sort of set. So I'm very, very grateful that I had them to, to tell me, you know, hey, you know, you can do this, you should do this, because jumps a great product as everybody knows and I've had a lot of fun um, moving over and, and learning and growing and um, you know doing that so I, I'm glad that that team and those women um, are in my life and um, so that's that's other than the other great things that we do uh, that's just that was part of my career um, a career move for me. Thank you for sharing that and that Women's Initiative Network is a great group I'm remote so I don't get to fully participate uh, in all that they do but thank you that's yeah. awesome. Right. Well, um, what what do you um, work on in the jump host testing team? Um, I guess I work on everything kind of data table. Um, I work on all the things that you see, like with columns, um, scripting, table variables. Um, if you were going to format something or you want to copy and paste into cells, I do the stuff that's kind of under the tables menu. Um, so summary, subset, join, um, concatenate, data table compare. Um, I do a lot of testing on tab, uh, tabulate and recode and quite a bit with the, um, with the data filter, local and um, global data filter. So, um, you know, kind of the initial, I guess, when somebody's starting jump is the tables that you start opening and all the things that you start doing. It's, it's most of that initial um, data table cleanup things. Very core stuff. Good. Uh huh. Yeah. Well, um, what other features uh, have you worked on in the past? I guess one of the biggest things that I, I got the opportunity to work on was um, the virtual joins in the mm. data table. And so they were, I guess, birth, so to speak, in Jump 13. And uh, they've evolved uh, through Jump 14 and 15. And um, that was really fun to be part of the development of that and to work on, on those from the beginning and be involved in the conversation of how it would work and, and learn you know, about that. And then um, to add to that, the Jump Life Sciences Division decided they thought virtual joins would be really neat and you know, help them with their products. So I got the opportunity to also cross over and work with that team. And you know, that's a great group of people too. And 
um, they, we also did some revamping on the data filters. And so when we were doing all of that, we, I worked with them as well to make sure that, you know, the filtering still worked the same way that they needed. So, um, and if you don't know very much about virtual join, I'm, I'm not actually showing that today, but that is a really, a really cool feature. And I, um, I know Kelsey and I have actually done a tutorial on that in the past. So that is, a, that, that's available as well, but, um, it's a, it's a great feature to, to jump. Definitely, especially with everyone working with bigger data. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, what is something that's non-jump related that you're passionate about? I guess that would be, I have a lot of things I'm passionate about, but um, I guess uh, one of the things would be that I love the beach and um, we go to the beach quite a bit. I've been fortunate to get to go down there um, to Oak Island, actually, it's the North Carolina beach. And um, I guess when I moved into the jump group several years ago, um, I, I was kind of in the process of um, being down there a lot and being involved. I got a little bit interested in the sea turtles and the nesting. And so um, I got a hold of some data and I did a discovery um, presentation using the nesting in North Carolina kind of and got involved with the Wildlife Commission. And I even ended up talking to um, Sky and Zoe a little bit about it and um, I learned a great deal about sea turtles um, and so I did my presentation on that and it got to be kind of funny at work I, I became known as the turtle lady you know and so I would show up at my office and find these little turtles you know in there which was great and I've got turtle cups and here's my here's my turtle nice. cup and I have um, you know this little turtle necklace on and so I've just accumulated a lot of stuff which I love all the turtle things um, but a funny story, uh, and as I share my screen, I'll, I'll show you this, is that my husband and I did some um, painting and different renovation, got some new furniture down at the, the beach house. And so we were looking for furniture, you know, preliminarily, and we walked into a furniture store and there was this beautiful turtle picture. And I said, I want to buy that. And he said, well, we're looking for furniture, so we don't need to buy the turtle picture. And I was, I the last lady, it was on sale. I said, yes, I'm buying this picture. So I bought that picture <laughs> almost a year before we decorated and I, I kept it and then I used that picture to sort of do the whole room mm -hmm. uh, around. So it's kind of funny, but that was kind of in the center. The turtles are kind of everywhere. So love it. Um, love the turtles. <laughs> Great. Well, would you um, show us a little example of, of the work that you've done with some of the turtle data? Sure, I'd be glad to. Uh, let me uh, share my screen here. Okay, can you see that? Yes. Okay, there's well, first of all, there's my, uh, there's my little room at the beach and there's my sea turtle picture. So I don't, I, I guess you can see that. So beautiful. anyway, that's, um, yeah, <laughs> that, that's where the, that's where it was the, the, int the interest came about. Um, so it's funny that, you know, repetition, I'm going to talk about a couple of things. It's funny that Pete and Mary shared about Internet Open. Um, I, some of this turtle data I got came from um, the Internet. So let me, um, I just want to show you real quick. There's a site called seaturtle.org. And so under here, I actually um, used the nesting data is where I got a lot of this data from. And so um, just to, sh to show you that, I decided that it would be fun to bring back some of this data for that I used for my presentation uh, before. And so I had a script because obviously if you read things in multiple times, I, when I did this before, I did like 2010 through 15. So I had this script and I went back and just changed it a little bit. So I got 17, 18 and 19, well, and 16 and read them in. And so this is the script. And if I just um, run this script, it will, it will do what, Pete and Mary were talking about it will actually go out to the internet and it it gets my data and so what this does is this actually reads in the nesting data the the nest and the false crawls which um, a nest, nesting is when the turtle comes out to nest the false crawl is when she comes out she gets scared or spooked and she goes back into the water and she doesn't lay eggs um, but anyway this is for um, 2017 and so I just wanted to show how that script worked and I'm going to close this and then just say this is my table that I had and so I created a year column out here so I've got 2010 and so I just concatenated I used um, tables concatenate to concatenate all the tables together so basically this is a representation of the turtle nesting and false crawls and and um, over on the right I have the 
um, hatching success and a few more data points over there, but it puts it all together. And so um, the scripts that I had still run, everything still, still works exactly the same way. It just had additional information. Um, so this is just sort of a, a distribution um, showing uh, or history, you know, showing the in the order of who who has the most nest. Um, Cape Hatteras and Cape Lookout up at the Outer Banks tend to have the most nesting all the time. There is a lot more mileage of beach up there. So, uh, but Oak Island is right here. So um, that's the one I was kind of interested in. So this is showing the nesting and the false crawls. And then um, I ran a, this is, um, this is showing, um, if you look over here to the right, this is showing the, the main months of nesting. They begin, it begins in May and then it's June, July, and August. The nesting hatching kind of goes, can go into October. Uh, but pretty much they're done laying their eggs, you know, in, in about August. But so this is color. This is just a graph showing the average. And you can see the, the peaks and valleys. Um, you can kind of see the counts here, here, and it goes up and down. And then it really dips down here in 2014. And then there's a little dip down in 2018 as well. And um, some of that happens just by the way the turtles swim. They come back to the same beach a lot of times to lay their eggs and some of them, you know, come and go back, but it varies. But a lot of times it can be um, a little bit weather related as well. And so um, I did went back and checked and there were some hurricanes, of course, that happened. In 2014, there was Hurricane um, Arthur that happened in July. And I, and I think what tends to happen is then the turtle nest can, can drown because if there's a lot of flooding, then they obviously won't come out and hatch, you know, you, so you kind of lose the end of the season. So I think partially that might be what happens. Um, and in 18, we had, um, I cheated and made myself a little note over here. So in 2018, we had Hurricane um, Matthew. And then of course, Hurricane Florence was, um, well, no, 18 was, um, so I'm sorry, 16 was Hurricane Matthew, and then 18 was Hurricane Florence. And then um, I did notice last year was a really big nesting season. You can mm -hmm. see this up here. So one thing I added to this graph was um, the something new is, um, and you can, you can see this little hover label. Actually, I'll hover here just so it shows up. Um, so there's a, a new feature in Jumpin' 15 where you can click and you can select hover label, and you can pick one of these things to as a hover label and I, I love tabulate so I picked tabulate and if I hover here I can see so this pops up and just shows me for that particular um, that particular segment that particular bar chart the the mean for the nesting um, for that so that's kind of a cool feature I guess um, it is I really like that and so one more fun graph from this table is um, this is a, a bubble plot um, and um, you'll see my little turtles out there. So um, I had created this before and it's just showing the nesting and the false crawls and then it's over time. So it's years. So it's 2010 and I added. So we're 2010 to 2019. And um, I just substituted the in the bubble plot and a little turtle SVG that mm -hmm. I had. And so um, this little turtle right here is my Oak Island turtle. So just wanted to point him out the color and where he is. And if I then go over here and I play my bubble plot. You can kind of watch him swim around. So <laughs> this was kind of a fun um, graph, but I, I can see that he ends up, you know, by 2019, you sort of back up here again. So good. Um, anyway, I just, I thought that was sort of fun, would be kind Very of fun nice. to, to show. Um, and so um, I did I did a thing kind of like um, this was another table that I had. So a couple things I wanted to show in here that just data table features. Um, Mike talked about distribution. I love the new feature we have here where you can click on this little thing and you can get the, um, the data table that the distribution headers in the columns because mm -hmm. it's really nice to be able to go over. And if you just want to quickly look at something, I love the fact that you can just open a distribution. And you can see right there, you know, what you're doing. Distribution is great for just analyzing and seeing what kind of data you have. Um, this table is kind of small and short, but a lot of times if you have a lot of data rows, it's really nice to, to look at what you have there. Great use of um, real estate on the screen. Yeah, yeah. 
And um, the only graph thing I wanted to show from here is the um, the this is a just a bivariate fit group, but it's basically showing the program beach success, which is just something that's kind of figured on based on the nesting and and how much how many um, turtles that that hatch. But the um, there's a direct correlation between I mentioned nesting and false crawls about the turtle coming out and then, you know, she doesn't lay her eggs, but pretty much the numbers, if you, in that first graph I showed with the histograms, you could tell they were almost the same. So there's a direct correlation between the two. And so um, this just kind of shows that in looking at this, this, um, this fit group that they're about the same. Right. Um, and so one other thing that I wanted to show, so I thought it would be a little bit of, um, fun to, I, I did a, um, an image thing, kind of like Mary was showing as well. It's just so funny that she, she did this. Um, <laughs> but you do learn things, I think, when you see them multiple times. Yes. But this is just a, another one of those images. And so I had read the table. And if I go over here, I have my, you can see my little turtle, turtle images. So the, um, as she talked about under the columns menu, I did sort of the same thing and used this text to columns. Mm -hmm. because I really only cared about in this particular thing, the, um, the, um, the date, I'm sorry. So um, if I do this, I can actually, well, I think I typed that wrong, but you see my point is what she yes. did too, is that um, I really only cared about the date. And so I kind of had already, already done this. So I created my date is right here. And so I did the same thing with this column that came in with a lot in it. And I really just cared about the turtle name, the hawk's bill, the green. So that's what I really wanted. And mm -hmm. similarly, as she did, I just created a graph because I kind of wanted to show these are um, a page they had images. So people had taken photographs of the turtles. So there were different images out there. Mm. And there were different numbers of them. So more photographs of certain turtles. But if I hover over this, this shows me this is a green a picture of a green turtle and um, green turtles are pretty common in North Carolina and the other one that's the most column are the loggerheads that so a lot of times if you're in any of the beaches and you see any of the nest hatch you'll see these turtles most likely a um, little bit less likely is the Ridley turtle and the um, these are the the hawk's bill and then this is one of the um, the black turtle you don't always see those around here. They're kind of in, located in different places, mm. um, not necessarily in North Carolina. Cool. And then one last little fun thing I thought I would do. I thought, well, what else would bring us a little joy during this stay at home time? So I, um, I love music and I started thinking about um, summer songs. And um, so this is just a little table that I um, created with a, a artist. We have a music artist over here. And then these are the songs we have. And in this um, column, there's a column property and it's called the event handler. And so you can see here that I, I have this Google search set up. So it's gonna basically go out to the, to the, um, the internet and it's gonna use the name of the song that I type in the column. And then I can go out there and get the lyrics. So if I click on something like All Summer Long, which is Kid Rock song, I think a lot of people know that, I went out here and, and you can, I grabbed the lyrics. And so I actually put the lyrics into this column here. So I have all the lyrics in there. And so I love um, Text Explorer and I love um, word clouds. So I ran this little word cloud. And so I just kind of wanted to see what would happen with some of the fun music. And so you can <laughs> see in here, um, sun and you can see um, you know, singing, and you can see summertime and vacation and some things like that. But one of these words I saw too is I saw, you know, ain't in here, and I thought, well, <laughs> the ain't's not a word. So I thought maybe we should maybe we should look at that and consider, you know, recoding it. So um, a couple things about the recode window that are um, new in 15. If I wanted to go in here and just do a little cleanup. I clicked on collapse white space. And so I can see over here kind of keeps track now of what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So it collapsed my white space, um, you know, 35, 35 of those um, white space things were gone. You can also remove punctuation, which um, 
I may or may not want to do, but um, because I like the fact that certain things like hey, 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 or you know, put in parentheses. So, but if I did that, I could see that it will remove punctuation like this. And so um, you can also click on these and you can, um, you can undo them with this mm. little arrow here. So, um, but let's go back to that word ain't that I didn't like. So if I go over here and say replace string and I look for the word ain't, um, I can see little things highlighted like this little asterisk here shows me this is selected. And if I wanna see what's modified, I can narrow that down and just see those are the songs that have the word ain't in them. So maybe we would change that to, I don't know, maybe is not. I'm not sure if that not, that would be more grammatically correct. Um, but you could say, okay, and then go down and you could recode that and that will create some lyrics for me in a, a different column. Nice. So um, just a little fun with some of those things. And um, so that's, that's, kind of all I have today, but I just thought maybe that would be kind of a fun topic. Yes, both informative and entertaining. Thank you, Mandy. <laughs> so one last question before we go. What is something most people don't know about you? Um, I think that might be that um, I um, played basketball and volleyball in college and ran cross country. Um, and maybe that comes from some of my competitive, competitive nature or my, uh, the, the back to the NC State Tar Heel you know, competitive stuff when it comes to sports. Um, I still run, I still like um, swimming and I, you know, ride my bike and stuff now, but um, a lot of people may not know that I played um, in school. Awesome, thanks for sharing that. And thanks sure. for taking the time to be our featured developer this week. Thank you, Anne. Thanks, Julian, back to you. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Anne, and thanks so much, Mandy, for joining us. Uh, we'll actually ask Mandy to put some of her uh, materials on the segment page. Uh, I know she showed some interesting scripts for pulling data and that kind of thing, and so we'll get those up there, community.jump.com slash jump on air. In our next segment, we have Manager of Customer Care and the MC of our Discovery Summits to take us through discovery and why you should care. Jump Discovery Summit is two and a half days of really great information for Jump users. We've got more than 48 breakout talks from our developers and from Jump users covering a variety of industries and topics. We've got e-posters down the hallway behind me where we've had students and folks from around the world creating posters. Between the breakout talks and the plenaries though. Well that was a different time. Back in 2018, when I was hosting Jump Discovery Summit from SAS World Headquarters in Cary, North Carolina. Now, like many of you, we're working at home and we're working on Jump Discovery Online. That's right, with Jump Discovery Online, you'll be able to attend virtually from wherever you are. No travel costs, no hotels, no hassle. Discovery Online will have all the things you love about Discovery Summit. We'll have Keynote presentations from John Saul and other thought leaders. Tutorials to make sure you know how to use Jump most effectively. Meet the developers. We're figuring out how to offer you this valuable opportunity to interact with the people who make Jump. Finally, the paper and poster program. Discovery Summit is full of papers and posters from Jump users just like you. And we're going to keep that paper program as we go online this year. The call for content is open for two more weeks, and we want your submission. We know you've got a great story to tell. So go to discoverysummit.jump and submit your abstract. If you haven't submitted an abstract in the past because of travel, this year, that's no problem. You can present from the comfort of your home or office. Not sure about public speaking? No problem. With an online audience, you don't have any idea who's watching. Kind of like me right now. Are you really watching this? I'm sure you've got a jump story to share. Perhaps you used a platform in jump to solve a particularly thorny process problem. Perhaps you've got a keen understanding of a particular feature in jump. Take a look at the presentations and materials from past summits in the jump user community. I'm sure you'll find inspiration there. No matter what it is, think about sharing with others at Discovery Summit Online in October. 
We're excited about Jump Discovery Online, and we hope you will be too. So please, join us in October, and there's a better than even chance that I'll be hosting from right here in my backyard. See you in October. Thanks so much, Jeff. We do hope you submit. That's discoverysummit.jump, and we hope you attend. Uh, there's a very good likelihood we'll see Jeff by his fire pit as well. Thanks so much, Jeff. Our next speaker, or our next segment, is by Phil Kay, returning again to take us through why DOE, and this time he's going to take us through reason number four, clarity. Hello again. So this is the fourth in this series about why design experiments. And just to remind you, this is based on a series of blog posts that I wrote a couple of years ago. Today, I'm going to answer these questions. First of all, we'll recap why I wrote this blog series in the first place. We'll recap what we talked about in the previous episodes. We're gonna be talking about clarity today. So clarity is one of the big reasons why we design experiments. And there's a couple of technical terms there, uh, things like aliasing and confounding that I want to explain to you today. And then we'll also talk about what we're going to cover next week. So I wrote this blog series originally because I think design of experiments, DOE, has huge value for scientists and engineers, and I want every scientist and engineer to be using it. Well, I think one of the barriers to people using it is that there's a lot of terminology, and that can make it seem a bit mystical, a little bit difficult to understand. So the purpose of this blog series was to use a case study to demystify design of experiments and to explain some of this terminology. In previous episodes, we talked about the case study that we're using here as an example, and that's around developing a method for testing contaminants in water. And what we need to do to have the best chance of detecting contaminants at the lower le lowest levels is to optimize something called a large volume injector which concentrates up the sample of water. The problem is there's lots of different things that we can change. There are lots of factors. In fact, there are eight factors, and that leads to a huge number of possibilities, which we spoke about. In this series, we're talking about how we can understand this process, understand this system, using a very efficient experiment where we only need to test 26 of these thousands of different possibilities that we could potentially think of. We spoke about how design of experiments isn't just about trying lots of different things and finding something that works. It's about giving you the best chance to learn about your process or system. So we don't just find something that works, we understand why it works, and we understand what we need to do to make it work if anything needs to change in the future. That level of rich process or system understanding is a huge benefit for scientists and engineers working in industry. And an enabler of that is building models, statistical models. And last time we talked about um, a very simple example of you know, how many data points do you need to fit a straight line? and then expanded that when we're talking about these multi-factor systems. So today I want to be clear about clarity. What do I mean by clarity? What do we mean by these terms confounding and aliasing? So, you know, talking through the case study that we have, we'll get some understanding of that. And um, actually this was one of the longer posts in the series that I wrote here because I think it is a quite a difficult concept for people to understand. It's a really key concept. I think it's 
It's probably one of the most important things when we're talking about design of experiments. Our objective is to understand the process or system that we're experimenting on. That means that we need to understand with clarity what the effect of the different factors is. And we don't want ambiguity as to what's causing behaviors in our process or system. So when we design an experiment, we want to be sure that it's gonna give us that clarity. And the case study we have today, we've designed an experiment which has beautiful clarity. And I will hope to try and explain that to you through this demo in Jump. Before we talk about the full 26 run experiment, let's start with a simpler example. So here I've laid out and visualized an experiment for just two of our factors for the large volume injector. There's the volume of injection, how much of the sample we inject into the large volume injector and the speed at which we inject it, the speed of injection. So if we experimented on three levels, as we've been talking about, if we choose a, a low, medium and high setting for each of those factors, then there are nine possible combinations there. So there's a, a low, low setting, both factors low, there's a high, high setting, uh, there's both at the midpoints and so on. So just for those two factors, if we could experiment like that, if we could run those different possibilities, that would give us a really good understanding. That would be a, a very effective experiment for our problem. Now let's consider a slightly different experiment where we're not able to test all of those possibilities. Here, what we've done is we've taken out two of the possibilities. So we had um, up here, there would have been the low high so low speed of injection, but high volume of injection. And down here, there would have been the, uh, the high speed of injection and low volume of injection. Now the consequence of not testing those two possibilities is that we have some degree of correlation between these two factors now. So not thinking about the response, we're not thinking about correlation between factors and responses as we were last time. Just purely thinking about the two factors here, we have some degree of correlation. And actually we can see the correlation value here. We have a correlation of 0.5. Let's consider what happens if we remove some of the other possible runs here. So if we only tested these possibilities, where both factors are at low, both factors are at medium, and both factors are at high, well, in that case, there's actually perfect correlation. You can see we have a, an R value of one there, representing absolutely perfect correlation between them. So the consequences of using these different experiments to understand our system would be profound. Let's add on to our picture now and go back to design number one. Some data on the response. So now we've colored each of these runs by the response. It's just some simulated data here. So those runs that gave us a high response are in red and those that give us a poor response, a low response are in blue. So if we did this first design, where we test all nine possibilities, well then we can gain a rich understanding of this process, this system. We can understand the effect of the two different factors with great clarity. And that's because we have zero correlation between these factors. We've tested these in such a way that there is no ambiguity as to what the independent effects of the two factors are. Now, if we consider this one where we've taken away a couple of those runs and we have some correlation, we are still able to estimate the effects of each factor. However, there is a cost. 
we have lost some precision in our estimate of what the two different factors are doing. But it's not as bad as this situation where we've only tested the low, low, medium, medium and high, high runs. In that situation, we really can't hope to understand whether it's volume of injection or speed of injection that's had this effect. We can see for one of these possibilities, we do have a higher response, but we don't know if that's because we've increased the speed of injection or whether it's bec because we've increased the, the volume of injection. The two factors are completely confounded, we say. Now, when we come to build a model on this data, then again, it has profound consequences. For design number one, where we tested all nine possibilities, then we can build a, a very good model and we can understand the separate effects on our response of changing volume of injection and changing speed of injection. If we go to design number two, where if you remember we'd we have some correlation between these. Well, we can still see the effect of these two different factors. It's not radically different from fitting a model to the data from design number one. What we notice are that the confidence intervals on our estimates increase. So the cost is in some precision because we have some correlation between factors. We are not able to as precisely estimate the effect of our factors. It's not a disastrous situation though. So some degree of correlation between factors is okay, it's not ideal. However, if we have perfect correlation as we did for design number three, then we just can't fit a model with both of these factors in it. The two things are completely confounded and Jump tells us that there is a singularity problem. So with that simple example, you've seen how different experimental designs could have different correlation properties. Then there could be different correlation between factors. And you've seen the consequences of that. Again, if we have zero correlation, that's the ideal. Some degree of correlation is less ideal, but not a disaster. If we have complete correlation, complete confounding, then that's hopeless. We really can't understand with clarity the effect of the factors of interest. So let's now think about our 26 run design. And we have the, the data here from our experiment. Again, we've experimented on these eight factors here. And the 26 rows in this table represent the 26 different runs that were carried out. So this was run number one. The factors were set according to these levels here. And the gas chromatogram was recorded ultimately and the peak heights were measured and added together. And just to reiterate, we're trying to achieve the highest possible peak heights. We want to understand what settings of this large volume injector give us the biggest possible peaks on our gas chromatogram, that gives us the best measurement of contaminants in water. Let's start to visualize the correlation between factors in this real data set. And um, I should at this point thank uh, Camilla Delicio and Jonathan Donson from uh, Anatune who uh, very kindly provided this data. It's one of the reasons why um, I was able to write the blog series was because I've, they were happy to share this real data with me. So we've, we've got a real case study here with real data. Okay, but important thing to remember here is we're not really interested in the response at this point. We want to understand the correlation between the factors. So let's just plot one factor against another. So here are the 26 runs and you've got the three levels of volume of injection. Let's use Graph Builder here, we'll plot against speed of injection. And we can add 
an ellipse on here and that we can if we right click on the graph here um, then we can actually bring up the value of correlation and we can see that there is zero correlation between volume of injection and speed of injection so the way that we varied these two factors across all 26 runs of the experiment we varied them in such a way that there is zero correlation that's the ideal that's perfect if we want to separately understand how changing volume of injection changes our response the peak heights and we want to separately understand how changing speed of injection changes the peak heights this is absolutely ideal this is the correlation structure that we want to see and if we were in fact with this design if we were to plot any of these factors against one another you will see that there is zero correlation so i'll just switch one of these out at random let's plot volume of injection versus vent pressure instead and again you can see zero correlation so these 26 runs the 26 possibilities out of the more than 4,000 that we spoke of earlier we didn't just choose them at random they have been chosen such that we have zero correlation between our factors in this way if we want to understand the correlation between lots of factors then we can't just plot one thing against another in fact there's a whole platform in jump called the multivariate platform which is very good for understanding the correlation between multiple variables just to, again starting simple and just sort of building up the, the degree of complexity i've just got three variables here three of our factors from our experiment and you can see a correlation matrix table here and you can see again zero correlations between all of our factors these are ones here it's kind of a, a nonsense really that's just representing the correlation between each factor and itself which of course is one um, so just so you know how to read these tables, that diagonal there is essentially irrelevant. That's, that's the correlation between one factor and itself. So it's always going to be one. And we can see this visually here as well. Again, for example, here, plotting volume of injection versus temperature of injection. Again, correlation of zero. You can evaluate any experimental data table any data table for these kind of correlations using the evaluate design platform which is under the doe menu and this we're just looking at the same thing here the correlation between these three factors and it just gives us a different view because we might be looking at many factors and many effects we sometimes need a shorthand way of viewing that and one way of doing that is using this color map on correlations so here again the same thing visualized we can see that the correlation between volume of injection and speed of injection is zero so that's handy because now i want to look at all eight factors and see what the correlations are like between them well again this is confirming that between these seven factors there is zero correlation so we say that the main effects we spoke about main effects last time the main linear of effects of these factors have zero correlation a term for that is actually that they are orthogonal there is slight correlation uh, with this liner factor if you remember liner is a slightly different factor um, it's actually a categorical two level factor but it's such a small correlation that we're not really going to have to worry about it the effect on the precision of our model is going to be fairly minimal so this is why our 26 run design is really good we've got really good clarity because we have this zero correlation between our main linear effects or close to zero in almost every case then we're going to be able to with clarity without ambiguity understand 
separately the effect of each of these factors. So we really know what it is that we need to control, what we need to change, what we, how we need to set those things in order to ensure the best process, which in this case is the best measurement of water contaminants, giving us the, the highest peaks in our gas chromatogram. Just as an illustration, let me, um, let me contrast that with an example where the correlation is pretty horrible. So we've, this is a, the Longley data set from the jump help menu, uh, from the sample data in, in the jump help menu. So we have a response here, why? It's some kind of uh, economic measure. And we have six factors. So this is, this wasn't designed, this is not a designed experiment. It's observed data. You can see actually that one of these factors is the year. Uh, I'm not sure what these other factors are. I think they include things like employment levels and our Y is some kind of measure of economic activity. So the exact nature of the factors is, is not important. What's interesting about this case study and why it's often used in an example is that there's really horrible correlation between these factors really strong correlation so if we put this into our evaluate design platform in jump we see some really strong correlations between some of our factors so x1 and x6 are almost perfectly correlated as we'd probably expect with economic type data lots of things correlated in in the world of, of economics again between x2 and x6 very strong correlations so there's a whole lot of very strong correlation which means we're not going to have clarity there's going to be a lot of ambiguity when we look to build a model from this data so here is a model where we've fit the response versus our six different factors six different variables in the data and we haven't talked about this visual here but what this is telling me is that actually we can fit a very well fitting model we can actually explain a lot of the variation in our response according to our x's and there's some degree of statistical significance but let's look at our good old prediction profiler and see what this is telling us well we can see some of these factors don't seem to have much of an effect they're relatively flat other ones look to be important but look, just look at the confidence intervals so they're extremely wide what this means is that for x2 we're estimating that the effect is negative. So as X2 decreases, Y, uh, sorry, as X2 increases, Y decreases. However, the confidence intervals are so wide that there could actually be a positive effect. You could you know, fit a positive effect through those confidence intervals. So our understanding of the independent effect of these factors is, pretty hopeless and it's particularly bad you'll notice for those ones where that we saw were highly correlated between one another if you look at x3 and x4 there's uh, very narrow confidence intervals on those they're not particularly correlated with the other variables x1 x2 x5 and x6 we saw were all very strongly correlated with one another and that's why we've got this really unclear conclusion about their effects so that's absolutely what we don't want to achieve um, and you've seen now why the 26 run design that we created is so powerful it's enabling us to estimate with clarity these simple main linear effects because we have uh, such a good correlation structure there we have so little correlation between our factors so what are we going to talk about next time? So we're going to talk about some more complex behaviors. We talked about quadratic effects and we'll look at correlation between those as well. What we also need to talk about are interactions. 
These are often the key to really truly understanding our process or system and often the key to giving you competitive success in your business pursuits in, in your sense, science and engineering. So we'll talk about that um, in the next series next Monday. I'll hand it back to Julian now. Outstanding. Thank you so much, Phil. In our next segment, we have RT Maidel back to give us another mindful moment. Hello, everyone. My name is Arti. Um, welcome to the Mindful Moment. Um, I, some of you may know I'm the social media manager for Jump, but I'm also a yoga teacher. And uh, this Mindful Moment is an opportunity for you uh, to have just a few breaths and a chance to tune in to the present moment. So let's begin by just shifting forward on our seat. If you're seated and then bring your feet to touch the ground, feel the ground underneath your feet. And then from here, let's just begin turning our head from side to side. So just as if we're saying no, slowly turning our head, looking for that full range of mo uh, motion here as we turn, but gently, no forcing. And then come to the center and then we'll do some gentle yeses here. So lifting the head up and down, giving our, our neck a chance to have a little stretch and a little bit of different movement. And then here, um, inhale and then exhale your chin toward your chest. And then take a breath here, inhaling. And then roll your head over to the right side and keeping your chin tucked in toward your chest. Inhale here and then exhale, let's roll over to the other side, keeping the chin tucked in, feeling for the stretch on the side of the neck. Inhale here and then exhale, roll to the other side. We'll just do once more to each side, breathing in and then exhale, breathing out, rolling and then come to the center and then gently lift the head. Bring your hands to in front of your chest and clasp your fingers, interlace your fingers and look down at your, your hand and notice which thumb is on top. That's sort of your habitual um, holding of your hands here or your habitual clasp. So from here, take a breath in and then exhale, press the palms out away from you, straightening your arms. And then inhale, lift the arms up overhead, feeling for the stretch in the upper back and breathing in and breathing out. Inhale here and then exhale, let's lean to one side here. Notice the stretch on the outside of your arm. Inhale back up and then exhale, let's go to the other side. Again, looking for the sensation of the stretch. Inhale the arms back up again, and then exhale, release the arms down, and then bringing the hands again to in front of your chest and interlacing the fingers. But this time, undo that lace and then do it the unfamiliar way. So the other thumb is on top. Inhale here, exhale, press the palms away, straightening the arms. Inhale, lift the arms up overhead, look up, and then exhale side bend, inhale up and side bend to the other side. Inhale up, release the arms down. Bring the hands to rest onto your thighs here. Sit up tall. And if you can close your eyes for this next part, we're just gonna do some breathing. Um, you'll be breathing in for a count of four, holding at the top with the breath in for about two, um, two moments, and then exhaling for four, and then holding the breath out for two, a count of two. So it'll be a count of four in, holding at the top for a count of two, exhaling for four, 
and then holding out for two. So four, two, four, two. So let's try that. So close your eyes and I'll guide you through it. Inhale through your nose for four, three, two, one. Hold at the top for one, two, and then exhale for four, three, two, one. Holding the breath out for two and one, and then inhaling for four, three, two, one. Holding in at the top for one, two, and then exhaling for four, three, two, and one. Holding the breath out for one and two. One more time like this. Inhaling for four, three, two, one. Holding at the top for one, two, and then exhaling for four, three, two, one. Holding the breath out for one and two. And then just breathe normally. Keeping your eyes closed for one more moment. Bring your attention to the bottom of your feet. To your hands resting on your lap and to the top of your head. And then gently open your eyes. This has been your mindful moment. Thanks for joining me. Fantastic. Thanks so much, RT. In our next segment, we have Florian Vogt here in our Jump in Action segment to take us through Fit Y by X. Okay. Thank you, Julian, and hello, everybody. My name again is Florian Vogt, and I'm Jump Systems Engineer in Germany. And today's Jump action is about the Fit Y by X platform in Jump, and in the next 15 minutes, I will talk about the following three topics. First, when do you use this platform? And second, what are the four personalities of Fit Y by X? And then, I will show you the platform with uh, some personal example and answer the question, will I look like Arnold after quarantine? So let's start. What's the scope of Fit Y by X? When do you use this platform? And as the name suggests Fit, this platform looks to find something that fits. And in this case, it looks to find a relationship between a variable Y and the variable X, which means a relationship between two variables. And depending on the modeling type of the variables that are specified, the platform has four different personalities. So that means depending on the modeling type of the variables that you specify, the platform will do these four different types of analysis. And one is a bivariate analysis. Second one is a one-way analysis. Third is a logistic analysis. And fourth, a contingency analysis. So let's take a look in those. What are those four personalities um, of fit Y by X? And important is the modeling type of the data. So we differentiate these three types, which are continuous, nominal, and ordinal. And the platform fit Y by X uh, especially looks at whether the variables that we specify are continuous or categorical. And depending on, on that, we have um, two options. So we have a two by two matrix of choices, um, which gives us four personalities. So if we look at the first option of these, um, we have a continuous X and a continuous Y, uh, the platform will do a bivariate analysis. 
and that'll give us a um, scatter plot like um, display where we already see um, correlations or rel relations. And um, we can add a different, um, if a different fit lines like uh, regression, linear regressions, polynomial regressions, and so on. If we have a combination of a categorical X and a continuous Y, we get something like a group plot with uh, groups of Y values per X category. And here as well, we can interactively add um, additional analysis such as one-way ANOVAs, comparison of means, and so on. And the fourth one, we have the logistic platform and that fits probabilities for response categories to a continuous X predictor. And note that here, we have to differentiate between a nominal or a ordinal. Uh, in the nominal case, the logistic regression um, as the <clears throat> sorry, estimates a set of curves to partition the probability among the responses. And in the ordinal case, the logistic regression models the probability of being less than or equal to a given response. And then finally, the fourth case where we have two categorical variables, X and Y, um, we get a, um, a plot that lets you explore the distribution of one over the levels of a second category variable. That includes a mosaic plot, frequency counts, and proportions, and we can also add um, different types of analysis. Right, so in summary, we have these four different personalities that are defined by the modeling type of the variables that we specify, and, uh, and especially the two uh, variables that we specify. So let's move on to some practical data. And here I have to, to add some I have to add some information. Um, in this, well, let's call it a crisis, I searched for ways to keep me motivated to, to, to do stuff. And I thought I could use this time to, to exercise my, my upper body. And so what I did, I, I started a push-up challenge that I called pushing through quarantine. And <laughs> the, the goal was for me to, to be able to do 100 push-ups in a set of three to four series. Um, and at the beginning of, of, this, of this challenge, I, I was able to do three times 12. Um, the background to this is, that's me roughly. So I'm very sporty and I like challenges. As you can see from my legs, I'm good at running and cycling, but I've never really trained my upper body. So there's a certain lack here and there. So the challenge is about starting to do a little workout for this area. And while this quarantine is still continuing, and it's very long, we, um, I ask myself, or you maybe as well, how will I look like after quarantine? <laughs> so maybe this, maybe not. So that's unsure, so let's take a look at the data that I've collected so far. Okay, so, here we have the data table, and I started collecting in, in March, and I have uh, the date, time of the day, uh, the series that I've performed, also the number of pushes in total, which is the parameter that interests me the most. And if I now want to check if I have done some progress, I could use um, the platform Fit Y by X. So, I can open this platform either from the analyze menu here, fit y by x, or by just clicking on this icon, fit y by x. And note that in this dialog window, two factors are required as we have already uh, learned that this is platform about. So we can just drag and drop columns in their roles. We want date as a factor and total pushes as a y. And if you see this again, uh, this is just the matrix of options. But when I've added both, jump already tells me which one 
it will perform, which, which of its four personalities it will show. So I'll open this report here, and it'll just give me this scatter plot. And as the total pushes is my, is my goal parameter, um, I've already added like a, a green line, a goal, a reference line. Uh, as a matter of fact, when my wife found out, <laughs> she, she even added another one for me. Um, so, well, this is, this is the graph, this is the plot. And now, as in most platforms in Jump, we have this red triangle menu here, and this gives us further options. So, one thing we could be interested in, is there actually a progress? Or am I just stuck in one level? So I chose from the menu fit line, and that gives me a linear, linear regression. And it, it includes the regression line in the graph, but it also includes a formula and includes a summary of how the regression line fits the data. And note that in addition, we have a new red triangle window here, uh, menu here. And here we have more options to specify this linear fit. So we could add confidence curve and we can also adapt it in color and, and so on. If we think that this is not the most appropriate fit, just remove those here. Um, we could, of course, also specify other types of fits. For example, polynomial to the degree of six. We could add uh, special fit lines with X and Y axis transformations. We could also add spline functions, uh, smoothness for our values. <clears throat> if we wish to add some more information on the visual basis, we could, we could also add histogram bars. In this case, this is not telling us so much, just that at the beginning I was training or working up very strict, and then it got a little bit more, well, variable. But also it tells us in the beginning, I have been doing most of my uh, push-ups between 30 and 40 total. And it also shows that it is, was especially in the first period. So if I click the upper sections, see, well, it seems that in the later stages of the period, I was able to do more. So if I, if I want to look at those separately, like say the month, month of March and month of April, I had several options here. So as in many platforms, I could go to the red triangle menu and open a local data filter and just add month here. And then note that actually not only the graphical display changes as I selected, but also the fit. But I also have another option. So if I go to this again and I recall the set, I could now add month as a by variable. And that would then give me two different bivariate analysis of total pushes over time separated by the month. But then if I want to see if there's actually a difference between those, I could also want to do a one-way analysis. And there we have some very interesting options. Again, I open this and um, specify my total pushes as my Y response. And now I take month as a factor and it already tells me it'll do a one-way analysis. And then I get this group plot. And in the red triangle menu again, I have lots of options of specifying and doing analysis. And for example, I could add a quantized report to give me some more information. We get box plots for the display. We get information about how the values are distributed. We could add this group of reports, means an overput T. And it adds up some graphical display, these diamonds here with the mean value and the confidence intervals. And also it gives me numeric summaries. But jump is a 
very sophisticated in supportive graphical displays. So here we can choose um, another thing that is compare means and I'll just select the student's T. And what we get is circles. And each of these circles represents one group of Y values from an X category. And, and, and this is based on geometry. So if these circles overlap less than a certain degree, the two groups are significantly different from each other. And jump helps us even more by coloring these circles that are not sig significantly different with the same color. So now I can just select one of these and notice that jump automatically colors them in the same way. So that tells us, unfortunately, the two months are not significantly different. But wait, I see that in April, I had a few that were very, very low. So I'll just select those here and investigate them in the table. And I see that those were right the day or even the morning after I have done quite some solid workout. Or well, at least baseline workout. And I assume that I didn't even have breakfast there. So I think these are not representative for the data. So what I'll do, I'll uh, just right click those dots that I've selected and hide and exclude them. And now they disappear, but the analysis is not redone. So I can just go to the red triangle menu, go to redo and click redo analysis. What I get is I get exactly the same analysis, but without the two values that I've excluded. And note that now these circles are a little bit further away. If I click on them, I see they're differently colored. So jump helps me visually to say that these two groups are significantly uh, different from each other. Well, all in all, this is very promising data to me. Uh, so I'll keep on going with this. And yeah, to, to summarize my talk, talk here, um, <clears throat> We have learned that FitYBX is a platform to explore the relationships between two variables. And depending on the model type, modeling type of our variable, the platform will perform one of four analysis or personalities. And also, I think my push up capabilities are making progress. But one question is still open. So, will I actually look like Arnold after this? I don't know, data suggests, but I think I need some subject matter expertise. So back to you, Julian, I'll have to call Arnold on this. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks so much, Florian. Yeah, we'll have to have you on at the end of uh, the month and see how things have changed. Thank you so much. In our final yeah. segment of the day, we have uh, Have You Tried back with Ryan to take us through Jump Tabulate. Jump Tabulate allows you to create presentation tables similar to Excel pivot tables, except these tables are much more interactive and allow for some powerful data exploration. Let me show you how. With the car physical sample data table open, available from the sample data directory, I'll drop down from the analyze menu and select Tabulate to launch. What we'll first see is our columns of data on the left and a blank table with zones ready and waiting for us to drag our data over. Here I'll take a categorical column, country, and drag it to the drop zone for rows. I'll drag over horsepower into the drop zone for columns. Tabulate will show us a summary statistics associated with each of these levels of country showing the sum. To change this statistic, we can right click and select a new one or if we want several statistics, we can choose them from the left and drag them on top here. Jump will show us all of the summary statistics for each of those different countries. Select the Done button and Jump will close the Tabulate control panel. Or if we'd like these values into a new data table, under the red triangle, we can select Make into Data Table. And there's one more thing that I want to point out. You can format your data right inside of Tabulate. 
For example, let's say that I want to change how many decimals are visible for gas tank size. I'll drag gas tank size to the resulting cell zone and country on the left zone for rows. Near the bottom of the tabulate window, I can select change format. Then I can select use the same decimal format. And then I'll enter zero to eliminate decimals. Then select format to preview and then OK. There we go. Explore your data with Jump Tabulate today. Thank you so much, Ryan. Now, after today's show, we invite you, as always, to hit community.jump.com slash jump on air to see all our past episodes, to watch your segments again, and to interact with our speakers and ask your own questions. So again, community.jump.com slash jump on air. Make sure you follow us on all our social media channels. We have a lot to share and we share often. Check out your program guide. We have a lot of great shows coming up this week and really excited about our featured interview this Friday with Fix Tracker. So make sure to uh, join us then. If you want to share us with your colleagues, the link to share is jump.com slash J-O-A. That'll take them right to the schedule page, and that's the place that they can actually go to if they would like to subscribe for themselves. Please join us Wednesday, 11 a.m. Eastern Time, same URL. Until then, we hope you stay safe. We hope you stay healthy. We hope you're staying close, even as you're keeping your distance. Happy Monday, everyone.